Electrophile is anything with a positive charge. An electrophile is a cation. Electrophile is an acid. It has an empty orbital. And all these things are related to each other. It has an empty orbital because maybe it lost the electron. It doesn't have to have empty orbital because it lost electron. Some atoms also have empty orbitals. But this one in particular has an empty one because it has lost electron. And it acts as an acid because it looks for lone pairs. And not just that, it's a cation. It has a positive charge. So it so it goes for the negative charged things. So if there's a lot of electrons present somewhere, it will go and attack that. Okay. It looks for things that are electron rich. So it can attack them. Remember this thing. We say electrophile attacks. That's a term we use. That this is the one that approaches. And why does it attack? Both simple about that. It's a cat time. Electrons are negative. They are going to snap together. They are going to react. In all of the organic chemistry, if you understand the relation that positive attracts negative and negative attracts positive, your job will be much easier. Whether it is explaining the question or not, that, or understanding it. Just remember, wherever there is a positive charge, negative charge will simply attract it. And negative charge will repel negative charges. So electrophile is a cation. It, has, it acts as an acid because it has an empty orbital. Okay, and what's a nucleophile? Nucleophile is the opposite of that. It's an anion, it has a negative charge. It's a base. Why does it act as a base? It has a lone pair. So it is out to give that lone pair to something. And that lone pair attacks. And to show the direction of that lone pair, we use curly arrows. A full curly arrow shows an electron pair. And that pair goes somewhere. The curly arrow is always used to show direction of electron pairs. Note it down somewhere. Lick lesko. That a curly arrow shows the movement of lone pair or electron pair. Free radical. What is that? Sir, where will, yeah. where will the curly arrow be? Curly arrow will be from the lone pair towards wherever it is going. So, for example, uh, I have CN. CN has a lone pair here and a negative charge because of that. And let's suppose there is sodium ion. Now, sodium has a positive charge and CN has a negative charge. And this lone pair will attack sodium ion because sodium is positive. So, I will show this as a curly arrow like that. The third thing is free radical. What's a free radical? It is neutral. It doesn't have an overall charge. But... It has an unpaired electron. That's very important. It has an unpaired electron. These are the things you need to remember. How is an electrophile or nucleophile made? If you want to make electrophile or nucleophile, you do heterolytic fission. That is the process that produces these things. What is fission? It is bond breaking. Heterolytic, unequal bond breaking. And to produce free radicals, we do homolytic fission. Homolytic fission is equal bond breaking. The bond breaks, but electrons are divided equally. And we show the electrons using half arrow. It's still a curly arrow, but it is half. Remember this. A full arrow shows a lone pair, a pair of electrons, and a curly arrow that is half arrow shows an unpaired electron. Free radicals also sometimes have a dot next to them like that. Okay, so let's try this question. Uh, a couple of questions. Let's suppose I start with chlorine molecule and I do homolytic fission of this. Remember, homolytic fission. Go on, do homolytic fission on this. So when you do homolytic fission of chlorine, what happens? Chlorine has a chlorine bond like that. To do this, I will need ultraviolet light. Remember this thing. For Halogens, we need ultraviolet light. I'll explain why later on. So what happens now? This bond breaks. And how does it break? One electron goes here. The other electron goes here. Both of them get one electron each. So you're left with two chlorine atoms. Are they radicals? Do they have an odd number of electrons? Chlorine has seven, right? Yes. So it will have an unpaired electron there. So they are radical, both of them. Try to make a radical from methane. This is methane. Go on. 
do homolytic fission anywhere in that did you do it no is a valid answer you did can you tell me what i should do here we can put one carb carbon atom in the middle okay we put one carbon atom in the middle first tell me about the curly arrows where should i put them because that's how the process starts it's next to the carbon very good and would it be a half curly arrow or a full curly arrow uh half very good so yeah half curly arrow towards this and half curly arrow towards this right yes yeah so we get on one side i get hydrogen atom which is now a radical because it has an unpaired electron and on the other side i get a ch3 radical all right let's try one more time go on make radicals from this now you can make three different radicals from this in fact four different radicals so it all depends on which bond i decide to break so for example if i decide to break the bond between hydrogen and carbon so for example i would decide to break this one then i will get a radical of hydrogen a radical of this thing which i'll call fluoroethane fluoroethyl sorry not ethane this is a fluoroethyl radical i could also decide to break this bond the one with fluorine so when i do that and i draw a curly arrow here looks like a mcdonald sign upside down so i'll get fluorine radical and an ethyl radical notice that i am putting a dot wherever that electron is left over that's important because in organic it matters where the collision happens and you know collisions lead to reaction so placing that radical that we, number over there helps you see carbon. can we break the carbon carbon one we could break the carbon carbon one although that is a very strong bond so we'll need a lot of energy to do that but if you do that you will end up with these two radicals good thinking a methyl one and a fluoromethyl one usually we don't have enough energy to break this so we just get radicals like the ones i made before good good, good thinking very good all right so that is homolytic fission let's try heterolytic fission let's say i have a chlorine chlorine bond a carbon chlorine bond okay do heterolytic fission did somebody do it so first we have to decide which bond i want to break let's suppose i want to break this uh, carbon and chlorine bond now then the question arises will both the electrons go to chlorine or will they both go to carbon what do you think should both the electrons go to chlorine or the carbon sir chlorine why sir maybe because it's more electronegative perfect in absence of any other supporting chemical or a catalyst chlorine will win here because right now it's a tug of war of who gets both the electron and chlorine is more electronegative it has the higher ability to pull on those electrons so chlorine will definitely win but there are chemicals there are compounds that can tilt the uh, balance in carbon's favor that does happen we'll study about fecl3 for example it can do exact opposite of this it can make carbon get those electrons so we'll study about that later on so over here right now a full curly arrow happens it's important to draw the full curly arrow and uh, yeah you will get carbo cation because now this carbon has lost an electron and this chloride is it electrophile or nucleophile the chloride chloride is negative is attracted to positive so it is nucleophile in inorganic chemistry we talk about what charge these things have in organic chemistry we talk about charges that these will attack because all the reactions that we deal with depend on who's attacking what so that is why it's important to remember the is this thing nucleophile is this thing electrophile is this thing free radical so that is why we always 
we don't say it's an anion. We say it's a nucleophile because we know if there was a positive ion, I should expect an attack. Okay, so that's the nucleophile and electrophile breakup that we have got. All right, so I have three things here. Hydrogen, hydride, and hydroxide. Okay, which of these is a nucleophile? People Thursday is supposed to be a problem solving session. The hydroxide. Hydroxide, why? Because it's negatively charged, so it's attracted to... Very good. Very good. Another reason is it has a lone pair that can use to attack. But uh, primarily it's because it has a negative charge. Uh, do you know water? We used to say that water ionizes or acids ionize in water. What's happening? They're simply doing heterolytic fission. So the bond between water breaks down like this and you get hydrogen ion and hydroxide. Similarly, when you see HCl, there's a heterolytic fission and it changes to H positive and chloride negative. Pretty straightforward. All right. Uh, I have uh, these three compounds. Okay. Uh, in one of them, I do heterolytic fission and this one becomes a carbocation. And in the other one, I do heterolytic fission and this becomes a carbocation. Which of these is more stable? Uh, sir, the first one. Why? Because it's um, a secondary carbocation. Good. So secondary carbocation is more stable than primary carbocation. That is a fact. What's the reason for that? You're absolutely right. That is correct. And you'll get one mark for that. But one mark is for explanation. What should we write there? It doesn't have to be Samin. Somebody else can also. But Samin, you can answer if you want to. No restrictions on that. So what's the question? <laughs> question is, why is a secondary carbocation more stable than a primary carbocation? Uh, so because it has like um, the activating group providing electrons. Very good. Excellent methyl which is attached on both sides uh, this is a methyl this is a methyl the this is an activating group so it will provide electrons to this carbocation from both sides which will ensure that it stays positive it's mitigated to some extent and on this side you have ethyl which is also an activating group but because it's just one ethyl its inductive effect cannot counter the inductive effect of two methyls. Uh, although ethyl individually will have a greater inductive effect than a methyl. For example, in a third, let's say I also had this thing here and a carbocation here. Then between this one, let me label them one, two, three. Between three and two, two is a more stable carbocation because ethyl has a stronger inductive effect. We call it positive inductive effect. Ethyl has a stronger positive inductive effect than methyl. But between one and two, one wins. One is more stable because it has inductive effect from two sides. All right. So knowing activating and deactivating groups is important when you talk about these carbocations. And knowing electrophiles and nucleophiles is important when you talk about organic reactions. Okay, now here's a small map that I want you to map. Uh, a few questions that I want to do after telling you a few things. A few terms that we will be using. And uh, right now, I'll just tell you what they are. Uh, I don't expect you to internalize them at this stage. Okay, but just be familiar with these things. So there is a term substitution. What do you think it means? To replace something. And that's what substitution does. So for example, if I have a reaction here, CH4, and suddenly it changes to CH3Cl, then I know that one hydrogen has been displaced by one chlorine. Similarly, if I had CH3Br, 
and now I'm looking at it and it is CH3OH, I know that something happened and bromine has been replaced by hydroxide. In fact, it's not bromine, it's bromide that was replaced by hydroxide. So that's substitution. Now, electrophiles can only ele substitute electrophiles. Nucleophiles can only substitute nucleophiles. Free radicals will substitute free radicals. So that's a very important idea to remember. Students usually confuse them. Uh, yes, Nausha? Sir, can you repeat what you just said? I said that if when it comes to substitution, same species substitute each other. So a nucleophile will substitute another nucleophile. An electrophile will substitute electrophile. A free radical will substitute a free radical. Uh, so that's substitution. One thing comes in, the other goes out. And they're both the same kind of species. So if I say that this is free radical substitution, then you know right away that the hydrogen that went out was a free radical and chlorine that came in was a free radical. Okay. And if I say this one is SN, SN means nucleophilic substitution, then you know right away that this hydroxide that came in is a nucleophile and this bromide that went out is a nucleophile. So that's that. Similarly, you can get electrophilic substitution as well, but we'll, that's the same thing. The next term that is important is uh, addition. Addition is when you add multiple things to make one product, when you add multiple things, which means there must be space to add something. So addition always occurs when you have double bond, when you have triple bond. In single bond compounds, when carbon-carbon bonds are single, there's no place to add stuff. All the slots are filled. But when you have double bonds, those can be broken and new slots can be made up. And that is why addition happens. Uh, again, you can get nucleophilic addition. You can get electrophilic addition. But you will never get free radical addition. I've never seen that. But the reason this happens, addition always occurs because of charges attracting. The addition always occurs because of charges attracting each other. So for that, you have to remember that electrons in pi bond are more delocalized. What does that mean? For example, if I have one nucleus here, one nucleus here, and they have a sigma bond in the middle, this is a sigma bond, they're both pulling on these electrons. So the electrons are not that free to move around. But these pi electrons, they are kind of further away and the pull is not that strong, as strong as this one, which is why pi electrons are more delocalized. What does that mean? That means that if I had, so what charges do pi electrons have? Sir, I don't understand this. Which part? The addition part. Addition ko liye, you have to understand that electrons that are in a pi bond, you know what a pi bond is, right? It's a second bond that is made, double bond or a triple bond. They are more delocalized. They're not as restricted as the sigma one. Why? Because sigma is usually right made by over head on overlap and the sigma bond molecules are very strongly attracted by uh, I received this picture from one of you so I'll just use this picture so if you look over here the two nucleuses the two nuclei are pulling strongly on the sigma bond the electrons that are moving around and there's electron moving around here somewhere it is being pulled by these uh, sigma, these nucleuses very strongly. But in a pi bond, the nucleuses are right over here. So the pull on the pi electrons that they have is not as strong. In other words, pi electrons have greater freedom to move around and sigma electrons don't have that freedom to move around. Clear? The pi electrons are more delocalized, they're more free to move around, which means 
that they will attract positively charged things more than sigma one. What are positively charged things called? Things that have a positive charge. What do we call them? Electrophiles. Electrophiles. Very good. So if you have an electrophile, there's a high chance then that electrophile with its lone pair will attack these pi electrons. Because it's not a negative charge, why don't you come to it? It will come. So it will bring its lone pair. And that is why I'll show uh, curly arrow. So that is the primary reason addition happens. So can you repeat this the, after the pi bond thing, the electrophile, like I don't understand. Sure, no problem. So we know that pi bond is negative, just like every other electron pairs that are there. But that electron is not stationary. That's not being confined by other nuclei. It's kind of free. It's around the molecule. It's able to move around more. And because it's able to move around more, it's going to be और वो जब नजर आ जाएगा तो उसको नजर लग भी जाएगी है। The electrophile will attract, will be attracted to that negative charge that is all around the nucleus. एक मॉलिक्यूल है मीथेन या इथेन। इसमें सिंगल बॉन्ड है, सिग्मा बॉन्ड्स हैं। यहाँ पर कोई इलेक्ट्रोफाइल आएगा नहीं, क्योंकि वो अटैक करने के लिए उसको बहुत गौर से देखना पड़ेगा कि वहां पे इलेक्ट्रॉन्स हैं कि नहीं बट यहां पर मेरे पास इथीन है इथीन में ये जो इलेक्ट्रोफाइल होगा उसको ये दूर से नजर आ जाएंगे ये पाए इलेक्ट्रॉन्स घूमते हुए वो बड़े आराम से इनको अटैक कर सकता है सो इन इलेक्ट्रोफाइल विद इट्स लोन पेयर विल अटैक दिस पाए इलेक्ट्रॉन क्योंकि इलेक्ट्रॉन है ना नेगेटिवली चार्ज है एंड दे आर मूविंग अराउंड देयर इज अ क्लाउड ऑफ नेगेटिव चार्ज that is moving around further away from the nucleus compared to the sigma bond. And that is why the electrophile is able to attack it. It will, why wouldn't it? Positive attracts negative. Hamesha, har reaction mein positive attract negative ka rule nahi bhoolna. It seems like a very simple thing, but it's very important. Two electrons next to the electrophile, like it doesn't it accept lone pair. Like why is it giving the lone pair here? Oh my God, I've been drawing it wrong. There's no lone pair here. It has a positive charge. Thank you so much for pointing that out. What's with me? Okay, so it has a positive charge. So it will attract or it will attack the negative electron cloud that you have. And this is why addition happens. Okay, moving on. Elimination. Elimination is pretty simple. Elimination is kind of like condensation. Basically, you remove a simple molecule, a small molecule in both of them. Okay, so they're both removal of small molecule. That small molecule could be water, Ammonia, something like that. HCl, small molecule. Now, if you remove it from the same thing, if you remove them from same molecule, then that's elimination. But if you remove them from multiple molecules or different molecules, then that is condensation. I'll give you an example. Let's suppose I have uh, ethanol. I remove H, I remove OH. I basically make water. And now these things are like that. I've removed H from one side, OH from one side of the same molecule. So now they'll bond together and they'll form. Eating. But if I had an alcohol here and uh, I don't know, 
for carboxylic acid here. And I removed H from one and OH from the other. Then this is going to be condensation. In both the reactions, I'm removing H and OH. In one, I'm removing it from the same molecule. So it creates a double bond and that is elimination. In the other one, I am removing them from different molecules. Of course, they join together now. I will get an ester. This is olives, nothing new here. We are just giving it a new name, the same process. We olives in condensation process. But we were like, no, this is condensation polymers. It's the same thing. Esterification we were doing. And we used to call this dehydration because you're removing water. But that's also elimination. Okay. So elimination, condensation are technically very similar, but there is a primary difference that one is on the same molecule and one is on different molecules. Then we have addition, which depends on some electrons being moving around, being slightly delocalized. And then we have substitution, which can be of free radical, nucleophile, or electrophile. Lastly, we have uh, oxidation. Oxidation can mean two different things in organic reactions. Three, actually. One is that you get oxygen. Okay. The other is you lose hydrogen. And the third is you lose electrons. So for electrons and oxygen, you have electrons and that hydrogen, you have oil rig. Oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. Iska, hydrogen and electron. And uh, for oxygen, the, it's pretty straightforward. Now we will use a symbol, this. This means oxidizing agent. This does not mean oxygen gas. This means oxidizing agent. And we will use this symbol. Now this can mean two things. It can mean a concentration of hydrogen, but usually we don't have hydrogen radicals. Mainly we use it to show reduced reagents. Uh, do you remember any oxidizing agent or reduced reagents? Sir, potassium iodide is a reducing agent, I think. Very good, very good. Potassium iodide is a reducing agent, yes. And what does it do? Potassium iodide goes colorless to brown. And it has to be aqueous. Does anybody recall an oxidizing agent? Hmm. Do you remember any? KMNO4. KMNO4, yes. Acidified KMNO4. Not just any KMNO4. Acidified KMNO4. Basically, it gains five electrons. So it goes purple to colorless. There's also carbon monoxide reducing agent. Takes electrons, takes oxygen. Carbon takes oxygen. But carbon itself, organic compound, we don't need to There are a few more that I'm going to show you now. One is sodium borohydride. There, it's a reducing agent. This is white ionic solid. It's a structure. You just need to know that if you need a reducing agent, this will be a really good one. But it's a better or LIALH4. LIALH4 is much, much more uh, reactive, but it's also very explosive. So never with water. Never use this one with water. So if you have uh, aqua solution, 
पास भी नहीं लेके आना इसको बहुत ज्यादा अनस्टेबल होता है तो ये फट जाता है धमाका हो जाता है बहुत डिफिकल्ट सिचुएशन में जाती है और ऑक्सीजाइजिंग एजेंट्स आर मोर फन दे आर कलरलेस कलरफुल देर इज वन विच वी कॉल फेलिंग सोल्यूशन फेलिंग सोल्यूशन इसका एक्चुअल फॉर्मूला तो आपको याद करने की जरूरत नहीं है बट फेलिंग सोल्यूशन हैज कॉपर टू आइन विच चेंजेस टू कॉपर वन आइन तो कैन यू रिकॉल द कलर्स कॉपर टू का क्या कलर होता था ब्लू ब्लू वेरी गुड और कॉपर वन का रेड रेड वेरी गुड सो इट गोज फ्रॉम ब्लू टू रेड लाइक लिटमस and then we have a tollens reagent tollens reagent agar kisi lab mein hai to wahan pe pata lagta hai ki school kharch raha hai paise don't expect it any i won't say so tollens reagent is kind of expensive itna zyada nahi lekin thoda sa and what it does is that it makes silver okay so it has a uh, silver ions that form silver oxide okay so pehle uske paas silver hota hai jisse wo silver oxide bana leta hai okay and uh, that is why it is called a silver mirror test okay and uh, it's a precipitate okay so what does it do what do you mean what does it do it so basically forms a brown pest it basically forms a kya ho sakta hai silver mir silver kya matlab i'll just check get a picture for you वो क्या होता है पिक्चर से इज अ थाउजेंड वर्ड्स यप सो ऑन द राइट साइड दिस वन इट्स इज कलरलेस बट हेयर इट हैज मेड अ सिल्वर मिरर दैट इज एक्चुअली अ वेरी शाइनी ओपेक थिंग बड़ा खूबसूरत होता है उसमें आपको अपनी शक्ल नजर आ जाएगी इट्स एक्चुअली अ मिरर So it turns silver to colorless. Yeah, it's not silver to colorless. Colorless to that silver mirror. Okay, but remember that both tollens reagent and felling solution are weak oxidizing agents. okay there is also another oxidizing agent which is k2cr2o7 it used to be in o level syllabus but now it's not but in as it is this goes from orange to green and the reason it does that is because it has uh, chromium ions okay so shuru mein i think it is chromium 6 if i'm not wrong let me figure it out yeah it is chromium 6 so it goes from chromium 6 to chromium 3 and that is why you see a color change uh this is a very bright orange color bada khoobsurat sa hota hai Uh, let me get a picture yeah yep this is a uh, uh what do you call it? potassium dichromate and you can see it's very dangerous which is part of the reason it was taken out of the syllabus ke lab mein use na kare bach uh Does anybody remember what this sign would mean? This one. Yeah. 
sir is it that don't dump it in like water bodies yes and why sir because it would kill the fish how it would be on to the eutrophication 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 yes but it will actually poison them as well and the left one is that it's toxic corrosive sorry i haven't seen the middle picture pehle kahin so i don't know what it means the second last shows that it's an oxidizing agent okay so if you have a fire this will actually increase the fire intensify the fire and the last one is pretty straightforward that potassium dichromate is a pyrite So it means that it kills its poisonous. It's not a pirate. All right. So these are oxidation and reduction uh, things that we need to know about. Uh, we will talk about these reactions. Jaise jaise aate jayenge, I will I will introduce them to you. I don't want to dump so much information on you right now. Okay. Uh, we'll take things slow. There is this one also a weak oxidizing agent. No, this is a very strong oxidizing agent. As good as KMnO4. KMnO4 is also very strong because it takes five electrons, but K2Cr2O7 takes three electrons, so that's also pretty strong. Okay, so yeah, that's it for today.